Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Here we answer your questions seven days a week. Alexander, what's up first? First question this morning is from the QR code. Gabriana Echeso Mistiera in Sault Ste. Marie is asking, what is a cheap option to bring NDI and NDI HX signals from several iPhones into different HDMI inputs of an ATEM mini switcher? Maybe spare laptops using these, one per phone, each running NDI suite connected to ATEMs, HDMI, or other gears and devices. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Uh I, I'm unaware of a cheap way to do this because kind of the benefit of, of NDI and NDIHX is that it becomes the switcher. So anytime you need to manifestly put it out, your, your best way to do that would be to, to leave it in the switch and, and to, to have a software client that would do the switching. Uh, the cheapest way to do this is with an iPhone to HDMI adapter. I mean, just full stop. Ronnie? Yeah, the other way to do it is to use something like Mimo Live, uh, which is older, uh, already mentioned as a software. Uh, what you could do, and this is not the cheap way to do it, but you could have a, have a deck link card connected to a, a machine. Uh, for instance, a, a cheap Mac Mini uh, running Mimo Live, and then output um, the NDI feeds to separate uh, outputs. That would uh, work flawlessly, but uh, as pointed out before, uh, I would then think of just doing the switching in the software as well. Yeah, I'll echo what Jason and Ronnie had to say about switching uh, in software because you already have your sources in NDI. But if it's got to go into an ATEM, uh, you could definitely kind of hack something together if you have computers laying around that you can use kind of as an NDI receiver and then have HDMI out. You're going to have some some more latency issues there. Uh, the the other way to do it, if you if it's got to be NDI, like if they're the phones are physically too far away to deal with HDMI. Uh, you could end up with a Kilo View or a Bird Dog or something like that, but then we've kind of disqualified the cheap <laughs> because those are going to start at about four hundred bucks. Um, but give software switching a try; it might be the cleaner solution for what you're trying to do. Next question: Douglas Carmichael asks, "I just found out that the Twilio Authy iPad app will no longer run on Mac OS. How do you transition from one two-factor Auth app to another?" Jason? Great question. There are a lot of ways to do this. And the nice thing about two-factor authentication, uh, which in general is known as OTP like that, that's kind of the, the protocol for this, is um, every single OTP auth app will allow you to export the secret. And it actually is just a series of long chains. So that could be exported either as a QR code um, or as just kind of a batch text file. If you're looking for a, a client that is Mac only, but completely cross-platform, meaning iPad, iPhone, even Apple Watch, the one that I really like is OTP, um, OTP Auth, but you're going to have to type it directly into the App Store. You will never find it because there are so many of these OTP space Auth. Um, I also use Bitwarden for this, and it works really well. Yeah, I've had, uh, I made the mistake when I saw that the Twilio uh, Mac app originally was going away to think that Twilio was going away. Uh, it's important to note that Twilio is still going to be around, just it's going to be an iOS app only, not, uh, not something that's going to run on the Mac. Next question. Next question comes from Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas. Compare Downey to Cobalt for capturing YouTube videos. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm not going to answer my own question, but I'm going to. I just, I just was talking to Jason, and uh, I, I just downloaded Downey, and it's, it's like uh, comparing a Ferrari to a skateboard, you know. And I, I've got Cobalt, and Cobalt works great. You just pop a URL in there, and boom, you're done. You can also just uh, download the sound if you click the sound button. Is but. Uh, Man, I'm I, I'm impressed with, with what I've seen so far about uh, Downey. I'll let the less, rest of the panel pick it up from here. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I've been using Downey for about two years. I can't remember what I switched from, but after recommendations here, listening on the show to people who said Downey was uh, a pretty class act, I haven't had it fail on anything. I don't download a ton of th stuff anymore, but um, whenever I've had to, I, I had a process years back where I had to assemble something for the local West Coast Region Academy Awards presentations, and 
the number of different file formats I got from so many people around, particularly in like small market TV stations, it was unbelievable the different encodings I got. I needed something to be able to download them and then transcode them into other formats. And Downey became one of my two or three tools. That, in fact, I think that's the reason I kind of changed back then. And it did a fine job. It didn't get every single thing, particularly in terms of the transcoding. It's not as, as good a transcoder as things like Handbrake and uh, a couple of those tools who specialize on doing that. Uh, but it did a great job of keeping intact and downloading all the rest of the files I had to do. So that, that was kind of my transition into it. And it's been with me for a few years, and it's been great. Quick PSA on Downey. Uh, it is one of the apps that's available in Setapp, which is that Mac kind of utility bundle that you can get for a yearly subscription. So if you're a member, you can try it for free. Uh, Downey is a great app. And one of the things that you'll want to do if you're going to get Downey is also get the companion app from the same developer called Permute, which allows you to basically run a routine that after uh, something downloads from Downey, it can do the transcoding and the conversion to whatever format you're going to want to work in. And that's nice because sometimes on YouTube, the highest quality actually isn't in an MP4 or an MOV. It's a it's a WebM. And so, you know, there's a 4K WebM, but there's only a 1080 uh, MOV. So ha having the ability to kind of automate the, and batch those transcoding from whatever it downloads in Downey over to the format that you're actually going to want to play back and work in, it's really handy. Next question. From Neil T in London, with its impact on in-person and virtual productions, why does the panel think so many blue chip companies are forcing their staff back to the office full time? We'd love to hear everyone's theories. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I think they're pulling them in because they think they're slacking off at home. And uh, basically, I've, I'm reading all these news reports of employees that come back to the office, but they find ways to punch in and punch out with that and not stick around, you know? So I don't know. It's, it, they're just doing a roll call, getting them back in, seeing who they are and uh, getting them back in. I don't know if that's, if it's going to work though. Bill. So I think for, for generations, the big management schools, and you're talking about executive suite personnel, they've been taught and they've learned for, through experience to handle on-premises workforces, calling people into meetings and things like that instantly. Uh, there was a tendency for a while in the C-suite for a thing called management by wandering around where executives would just go out on the floor and kind of try to get a sense of what, you know, not, not formal conversations, but just kind of see how things feel. Does somebody look concerned or whatever, or, you know, you're talking to not just going through the people below you in the org chart, but kind of getting the sense of the people. And I think they feel like they don't have that as much anymore. Plus, people who are good on Zoom aren't necessarily people who have other skills that might be valuable. So I think they want to go back to what's comfortable. And the executives have the power to make these rules and say, I want this organization to function the way I want it to function. And I'm comfortable where I can go around and meet people in person. And so everybody get back here. Uh, I think part of it's like that. There's not a generation of remote managers working on Zoom who has come up because we didn't hit this until the pandemic. It didn't become as big a deal as it is now. So uh, maybe as younger executives rise up through the ranks and more companies are owned by uh, people who did not grow up in the old system, you'll get more comfort with that. But I, I'm not surprised by it. I do think Alex has mentioned this a couple of times. I do think Alex is right about the fact that the absolute best people, if they don't want to come in, you're going to have to accommodate them. I mean, you know, the, the really whiz-bang developers or uh, people who can do the work that needs to be done, if you're really good at something, you can kind of call your own shots. And I think people have gotten a taste for not having to be stuck to a desk 40 hours or 60 hours is probably more often the case. Uh, and so they don't want to do it. Simple as that. Ronnie? Yeah, as a European, I just wanted to pitch in what the meaning of blue chip companies, and that's a highly valuable uh, company, uh, often traded in the in the public uh, stock market and is seen as a, a market leader and having a stable, a good economy, stable growth, of course, big, and um, 
the term blue chip, I think, is from poker, where uh, the the blue chip traditionally has the highest value. So there's that. Jason? And as Ronnie said, these are not small companies. So they, they weren't, you know, born in a garage, you know, two weeks before COVID hit. These are ginormous companies. These are the Coca-Colas, the General Mills, um, you know, of, of the world. They're the, you know, they, um, I'm trying to think of another one. Um, I don't know. Whoever makes your deodorant, right? Like, you know, right, those are the gigantic. <laughs> yeah, Procter & Gamble. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Um, so – I think these are these are the places where middle management finds themselves in a place where to justify first you know, okay the cynic in me says to justify their existence um but like you know the 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 business uh, degree holder in me also says to enforce culture um you know middle management is going to come back to whatever they're comfortable with and um you know and failure to do so could be seen you know if they wait too long as a failure on their part yeah, it's one of those things where there, to me, it's it's a lack of understanding of how to manage remotely. If you have a business that has tens of thousands of employees or even hundreds of employees, and you don't have a really steadfast culture that is going to uh, translate well to everyone not being in the same room, you're going to find it difficult. I know when I had a team that got large enough that we moved into two separate areas of the office, our collaboration didn't work as well. And we had to start coming up with systems and ways of communicating and ways of being that were going to allow us to still function as a team, even though everybody couldn't just learn by osmosis because we all happen to be in the same room. To some degree, it is managers are trying to justify themselves and they're trying to justify the fact that they don't have the will or the time or the skill to manage people remotely. Uh, but in the end, the folks that learn how to do this well and learn how to develop the good work habits and the ways uh, and systems of accountability that are going to pe keep people focused while they're able to work remotely, those are the ones who are going to win because 10 or 15 years from now, people are not going, the, the, the good people anyway, people who are good enough to ask for it won't accept anything else. So I don't think we've cracked the code yet. I think it's still all too new for us to really, really know how to be successful at managing a remote culture. And there's going to be a lot of money made on a lot of business books <laughs> in the next five or 10 years uh, as we keep trying to solve this problem. But, but whoever uh, figures it out is going to be the one that ends up ahead. And guess what? The folks who are not figuring it out by saying everyone has to come back to the office and we're going to put our heads in the sand about this and just pretend like it's not coming. Those are the people that are going to be in the last place. Because if you're not at least trying to figure out how to make it work, you're going to get left behind. Neil, great question. Appreciate that. Uh, you all can also ask your questions if you've got one uh, in Makana. If uh, there you can vote on the questions, you can also chat about the questions. If you don't have Makana, you can also sign up at officehours.global slash join which will allow you to get emails with links into Makana, Discord, what's coming up on the show. Uh, but if you don't want to sign up, you can still ask your questions. Just go to askofficehours.global, and that doesn't require any login or sign up. So check it out, askofficehours.global. Uh, next question. From the QR code, Mary Ellie Jusha Mira and, and Wablo is asking, what do you think of MPI's, MP, uh, MPI's IMAX, America's in Vegas this year? What were the main takeaways for your events or how you work or track new contracts? Jason? Uh, okay. I, I'll admit, I had never heard of this conference uh, just straight away. I've been looking at it. I mean, it, it seems like just, you know, a nice three-day event. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I figured I'd take the hit. And, and if anybody knows, please jump in. But I, I had never heard of this particular one. Go ahead, Alexander. I'd never heard of it too. And when I went to the homepage, uh, there was nothing that really explained. I had to go to you know, a couple of clicks. I'm like, what is this? Your homepage doesn't say anything about what this is. There's no, there's no catchy slogan that ex quickly explains it. But uh, it looks like it is a, a very large conference for industries such as the hospitality industry, flight industry, events uh, space, that kind of thing. So if you're not in that industry, which I, I'm not aware of anyone on the panel that is because we're more on the production technical side of things, uh, then you're probably, I mean, you're probably not going to have heard of it. I mean, I, I didn't hear of it until I looked it up yesterday. So uh, I don't really have any comments, but that's apparently what it's about. Go ahead, Bill. 
I think, and I could easily be wrong about this, but I remember when I was doing some work in hospitality, that might be Meeting Planners International. If it is, those are the people who kind of form conferences and things like that. And so it's all the admins and professionals, if I'm right, uh, who do this kind of stuff. It's it's like there are all these verticals out there, and if you're not in that vertical, you probably wouldn't know of their conferences. And those are the kind of people who end up in Las Vegas for their conference annually. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. I've been going to Las Vegas for conferences for a long time. But if those are the meeting planners, then that that makes some sense that unless you're in that field, you wouldn't have heard of it. It is kind of amazing, no matter what vertical and what interest you have, there is uh, still some sort of conference somewhere that is uh, that is taking place. And a lot of them are in Vegas, but a lot of them are in smaller cities like Nashville or Indianapolis or St. Louis or Columbus. Um, I've been in the work that I do that's not in production, I've been to a lot of small, you know, smaller kind of secondary and tertiary cities to go to conferences. And it is really amazing to uh, when you are in that vertical or in that community and you are around so many people who are passionate about the same things that you are. And it could be meeting planning. It could be Comic-Con like Dave or like Bill goes to. Uh, I mean, there's, there are so many uh, areas of, of interest that can spark it. Uh, if you had, Mariella, I'd love to hear if you had a, a specific thing you wanted us to look at and if there's something exciting going on there. Uh, we'd love to look into it some more. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I, I dissed them. I said meeting planners. It's meeting professionals international. Uh, I believe that's what MPI is. So it's it's the same kind of thing, but I want to give them their due. They, they are trying to raise their profile as being the people who understand this stuff. So, yeah. There you go. And glad that they're working on it because we've all been to events uh, that where we had to travel a long way to get there and we're a little underwhelmed by the end of it. That's the worst. Think of all of the time and money that is spent to get somewhere and we're desperately hanging on to, you know, going somewhere in person as we're trying to make hybrid events more and more popular. And we're trying to do as people like the folks in this community are working to make the hybrid event experience as good or better than going to the actual physical event, uh, they need to be putting their heads together and figuring out what's next. So, and you know, happy that they're still there. But just remember, you got to be worth it because we're coming for you. Next question. From the QR code, Chuck Hodges in Tuolumne, California. What NAS will sync properly to our tape backup and to cloud service and offsite system with minimal overview and overhead. Is there one that has the cost of the cloud backup and restore system included? Process it uh, over 25 terabytes each day to these systems with Fuji FI. Jason? Oh, you just gave me PTSD with the tape backup. Um, okay. Honestly, I would work backwards from this. I think you need to contact whoever uh, does, whoever has or does your tape backup. The company that does that, you need to ask them which NASAs work best with their product because tapes can get weird. And the, the way that they back up and need to read and then reread and, and they kind of – I, according to, you know, if I were a NAS, I would see it as stalling because it doesn't really understand the technology. Um, I've yet to find something that I can't do with a Synology NAS. Um, but again, like I would work backwards and I would start with a tape backup and then let everything else fall into place. I would be curious as to 25 terabytes seems like more data than tape could handle in a single day, just in terms of transfer speeds. And maybe I'm Maybe I'm miscalculating my frame of reference there, but it seems like it could be slow. If I were to, if whenever you're looking at any of these systems, Chuck, I would look at what are my constraints, whether those constraints are uh, read and write speeds, network speeds, uh, capacity, uh, reliability in terms of needing to write over the same cells again and again and again. And whatever those constraints are, you've got to make sure that you're building a buffer around those. So, if, for instance, I was needing to process more data than the tape could reliably read and write in a day just because of transfer speeds, you might consider putting some sort of additional hard drive buffer in between the data that you're trying to back up from and the tape that you're trying to back up to. That way, whenever it's done backing up the initial 25 terabytes, you can keep offloading uh, out, to that, out to that LTO tape. LTO tape, but whenever you're designing these systems, the very first thing that you got to do is identify your bottlenecks, identify your constraints, and then build out from there. Next question. 
Paul Wall, who's in Austin, Texas, asking, the Shure X2U and MVX2U do not have line level, so how would you pad signal and compare the two generally? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm not going to answer my own question, but uh, right now I'm using this really old uh, Shure interface. See this thing? It's old. And I'm looking for to get it to upgrade it either with the X2U or the MVX2U. And you can you can grab these uh M2 M2 uh the older ones on YouTube for like 30, 40 bucks and the and the uh MVX2Us are quite a bit more expensive. So is the extra expense worth getting the new product or should you get a bargain on the old product and you guys know more about this than i do so i'm gonna toss it to the panel paul one of these days we're getting a cocker and i can feel it you're gonna throw it and you're gonna catch it you're gonna take it uh-uh, for now not gonna do it not going there bill's taking us to the end zone go ahead bill well hopefully i mean i assume you're saying that it doesn't have a uh, line level or, or maybe you've got a line level signal and you need to get it into this unit which only accept mic level the traditional way to do that is to use an inline transformer here's shoes uh, sure's traditional a15 as i think i've had one of these in my bag uh, bag for the last 20 years it's a switchable attenuator that takes a line level signal and you can dock it down 15 20 25 uh, decibels which is a significant decrease it'll get it down to mic level so if the thing needs mic level to to hit it and you've got a line level signal you're trying to get into it uh i've i had actually had a a case once where i was filming a guy who had a rocket go-kart he'd put a jet engine small scram engine on the back of a go-kart the thing was so ridiculously loud that you couldn't get within a block of it without hearing protection and i had to put two of these in line to get that uh, my my Sennheiser 414, uh, not 414, the old uh, 421U, which is known as a kick drum mic, uh, to get it down to the point where I could get a signal you could listen to. So for really loud signals, something like that in your bag is really useful. Alexander? Yeah, Bill's right about uh, attenuating the signal. There's a massive uh, difference in terms of uh, overall level between line level and mic level and a pad uh, would definitely help you there you probably would need to pad it significantly but also just keep in mind that there's also impedance great impedance differences between microphone and line level now microphones typically have a, a much lower impedance and line level has a much higher impedance so these are really the wrong tools for the job i'm not sure i'd like to know paul from you like what are you really trying to do here because these are not really the best tools for that Paul? Well, what basically I'm just trying to use a microphone and the quest, the, the, the other, you answered the, the signal padding aspect of the question, but the other aspect is for a mic, which would you get? Would you get the old interface for like 30, 40 bucks on eBay, or would you buy spring for $79 or what the new new interface cost well, hands Which one down you up for? i mean it's it has more the the preamp they completely redesigned the preamp on that so just for the sound quality alone then the additional headroom on the preamp i would get it and also the fact that it has usb uh as well so that for those two reasons i would uh, and i think it's a, it's a little bit smaller in overall design so it's a little more discreet a little more portable yeah, it's the the new one's 130 bucks. And just to hear, I had up a, a second ago just what the two of them look like. The one thing that I'd like to point out is uh, something, some might think this is a feature. Courtney would say this is a feature, not a bug. But uh, you've got physical controls with these little dials on the, uh, on the older X2U. Uh, the challenge with that is if you move it, if you hold it the wrong way, you're going to start to adjust and hit those settings. So if you're in a consistent situation where you want to, you know, Ronco rotisserie oven, like set it and forget it, the MVX to you is going to be a little slicker because once you get the Sure Motive Mix app on your computer and you've configured, how do I want the noise suppression? How do I want the gain to be? How do I want the padding? Do I need phantom power? No, do I not need phantom power? Uh, you're going to be able to set all those things in the computer and then that is saved to the hardware so no matter what computer you plug it into it's going to keep those settings so if you were sending this out in a kit to someone else the mvx2u is going to be a little bit more versatile if it's something that's just you just want a cheap way to plug a microphone into a computer 
the X2U is probably fine if it's just something that you're fiddling with, but you've but the trade-off really is your ability to get it into the computer and get all of those settings exactly how you want them and then not think about it again. And really what I think we all like to focus on in production is how do we remove the mental load, front load that work somewhere else so that when I'm actually trying to do the thing, the technology doesn't get into the way. I spent an inordinate amount of time in the room that I'm sitting in now so that I could hit a button and be ready to go in a minute. And I never have to think about it ever again. And that there's a lot of value in there that to me is a little hard to it's hard to put a number on, okay, is that worth 90 bucks? I think so. The last thing that I would say is if you're going to pair this with other USB microphones, whether it's an additional MVX2U or uh, the MV7 Plus, that it's going to also work in the Motive Mix app, these newer USB products from Shure actually allow you to plug multiple USB sources into the computer and then ha- mix them digitally. So without the need for a separate digital mixer, you can have multiple audio sources into your machine. So if doing a back and forth with someone else else is potentially in the pipeline, that's another reason that you might want to spring for the X2U or the MV X2U, pardon me, the new one. Next question. David Brady in New York. New York is asking, Zoom's native encoder live stream custom streaming service is handy and cloud-based. But worrisome, if things go south, what is the recourse? Ronnie? Uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, if, if there is a backup uh, uplink to something like Zoom or whatever, uh, you, of course, need to have a secondary encoder uh, getting the content from the Zoom meeting. Uh, what we've done to create backups, if that is what you're looking for, we use the Mimo Live. You can also use uh, something like... Um, Ecamm Live or uh, or even uh, Vmix to do that and just have them uh, do the backup or uh, the encoding out going out to uh, to the secondary backup stream. Um, if this is a really important uh, uh, broadcast, I would probably uh, go with some high quality encoders uh, that has full control over everything they are doing, uh, probably hardware based. Uh, those are getting uh, a little bit more expensive. I wouldn't be using anything less than, for instance, a KiloView encoder. And even those, in given circumstance, uh, circumstances, have some troubles. But if it's just a backup feed or or just a backup uh, of the of the broadcast in case you you lose everything um, going on in the meeting, I would just use something like Mimo Live or or, or similar. Maybe even OBS can do a screen grab that's even cheaper. But um, hardware for uploading and encoding, that's uh, that's my way to do it. And when you would get two separate hardware encoders going to two separate streams, or that way you've got that redundancy in there? Hang yeah, around obviously, for the second. that's the most secure way to do it. Hang around for more uh, talk about backups and primaries and alternates and contingencies and emergency plans for a second hour where we're talking with Keenan Campbell about production disasters. That's coming up in just a little bit here. Next question. Jeff Veely and Henderson is asking, with Bluetooth technology improving over time, there's a lot of debate of whether or not it is reliable enough for live productions. Panel, what is your verdict? Jason. Yeah, there sure is a lot of debate, and that debate gets really quiet if you're trying to do stuff like, um, it, as we did at NAB, trying to get a good range test on anything at all. Um, uh, yeah, I've never had good luck with with Bluetooth anytime there's any kind of signal, um, a, a, any sort of of RF interference and that like, you know, it was so bad that if we get all the way in on this, this lead for this giant camera that we spent two days building at NAB, that's electrosonics. Uh, I believe that, I don't know if that was for the mic or for the, the, um, the IEMs that we were using, but, um, it was, it was a substantial amount of RF interference. And, and if we didn't have like our own reserved frequencies, it would have been a complete mess. Um, I was having problems just simply using comms from my iPhone with hardwired headphones. Like, I mean, there's just, yeah. So my verdict is if you're in a control room and you you are, you know, RF isolated, great. Uh, but I would never rely on it. Yeah, and that was, and just for clarity, we weren't using Bluetooth. We were using 
the the super duper those high cost end thousands stuff. of dollars yeah hundreds of thousands of dollars went into the well, yeah for the video part, transmission yeah. for the uh, for the video transmission and we had breakup in our in a rf heavy environment so uh you've been warned bill <laughs> keyword is nope <laughs> yeah, I just don't think you want to go there. I, you know, Bluetooth. I, I, I. Here's what I think. I spend most days on long walks, and I like to listen to audiobooks when I do it. And I'm in the Apple ecosystem, so I'm using a relatively new iPhone. I'm using Apple AirPods. They spend a lot of time in engineering on them, and there's all sorts of small issues. When they work, they work great, and I don't have any problem. But there's the small issues of there's, you know, I have, I think, three pairs of iPod, uh, AirPod Pros. I have two phones that I use myself, and then there's my wife's phone separate to that. And the pairing and connection gets to be really problematic sometimes. You know, oh, I was on her phone last time, and now it wants to link to that. So I've got to make sure hers is out of range. And then once I get it linked, it'll stay there for a while. The dropouts and the switching are still occasionally there, even with that state-of-the-art small field on a walk away from really complicated things. I have issues. I can usually get them solved and I don't think I've failed to enjoy my books on a walk in a long time so I'm not saying it's unreliable technology I'd say it's fiddly still at this point and in production fiddly is a really bad word Alexander I wish I could just play back that that uh meme that gets passed around the internet of Steve Carell and Anchorman just screaming no over and over and over <laughs> again yeah I would never <laughs> use it um the only, you know, there's one Bluetooth box that Radio makes. It's a DI box called the, the BT Pro V2. And that thing has a 100-foot Bluetooth range. Uh, so that's using the newer Bluetooth 5, one of the flavors of the Bluetooth 5 spec. And that, that thing is cool because that you can Bluetooth to it, but then it has XLR outputs and you can plug it into a mixer. So that's a, like I would call it a higher-end Bluetooth uh, playback device, but otherwise, for anything critical, and it's already being discussed here, yeah, don't don't use it. I mean, in any situation, even with high end wireless stuff, I mean, CJ just talk, talked about this. If there's no reason to really use wireless, don't use wireless. Don't overcomplicate it. Just use a copper wire if you can. Uh, and if you're going to use wireless, then you know, use something that is going to be robust, and uh, you get what you pay for. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I, I suppose I'd take that back. There's exactly one circumstance where I have used Bluetooth, and it's my Dante Bluetooth interface, but that is just under my desk. I mean, it is two feet under my desk, and it's the only way to get something through. And it is so sticky that, like, you come anywhere near it, and it will just glam on to whatever, the, you know, whatever it had connected to last time. And um, I finally found it. These are the IMs that we were using. And keep in mind, at NAB, we were, like, two feet from the camera when we were talking into the microphone. Um, so, yeah, I, no, no, and no again. <laughs> Paul? I would say no, but I found a product, a Bluetooth product, that blows me away. Where do you guys see this? Look at this thing. This is the, where is the label Oh, is on that it? a Parrot? No, it's not a Parrot. It's a Logitech A60X. Here you can see A60X. It has three HDMI inputs. It has Bluetooth, and it has, you, you pop it on a base. It's got like a drop drop on base where you just drop it on the base and it recharges and it multiplexes the conversation so it'll mix like two sources okay i'll bite like, why do you have hdmi on a headset like i, I i've got to know for gaming for gaming it's a gamer's headset that's why but they claim the manufacturers claim they, logitech claims if you if you believe their manufacturers claims that this microphone is is I wish I could get it in the shot better. This microphone, there it is, is uh, production quality. Now, well, marketing hyperbole Mickey's having is a fit uh, right now because marketing this is hyperbole not really abound. production quality. But you know, we if yeah. you if if you anyway, this that is pretty fantastic. It sounds pretty darn good. 
Yeah, and I'm sure for if you're in, if you're into gaming, it's it's probably a really nice headset for that use case for that vertical uh, and. Anything with a Logitech logo on it, when they say production quality, even though even though they have the you know they bought all that technology from Blue Microphones and surely they're adopting some of it, I would be a little nervous that the marketing department's a little little jacked up on on whatever they're they're selling. And of course they're going to be excited. When but I wouldn't I wouldn't bring that to a set and expect to be taken seriously. Anything with Bluetooth. It's funny in the comments. David Brady said, you know, he crosses a, a New York City intersection and his Bluetooth connection drops from his phone because of how much RF there is. And uh, and even uh, Steve, he had, uh, or I'm sorry, Jeff had put in the chat that, you know, he says, just say no, but he gets pushback from solo musicians who use it for control interfaces. Listen, I've got Bluetooth control of the lights in this room and I fight with it. In, and that's just me. And sure, I have a lot of RF going on in this room, but that you can't, there's no... There is no replacement for a wire and the reliability and the confidence that you don't have to think about that anymore. And it is 100% in the bank. It is 100% going to work. The number one cost of production is failure. It's going to be the most expensive cost there is. And if and if it comes back to, oh, well, I couldn't hear them because I was on my Bluetooth comms and the Bluetooth comms dropped out because of interference, they're, somebody's going to say, well, that's unacceptable for the amount uh, that was on the line there. So I think our consensus is no, but maybe, maybe someday. Next question. I'll, I'll go with from your the, consensus. From the so QR I'll code, the uh, we have Gedgena, Shesho, Mysterio, and Sault Ste. Marie. ATEM is only op- switcher option. iPhones want to be wireless, NDI, HX, or too far away for HDMI. What is the cheapest solution to connect NDI from the iPhones to the ATEM? Please don't try to change a switcher that can't be changed. It's not the question. Oh, thanks for coming back on that. Now we've got a little bit more context. We'll get, have another go at it. Jason, what do you got? Yes, thank you. And on behalf of everyone, I apologize if you felt like we just did a bait and switch there. Your cheapest way to do this is still with a cable connection. And the way to do it with an ATEM means you need HDMI in. So the cheapest way to do this with your constraints is with a Balin. Balin is an easy way to take HDMI like you can get out of an iPhone and shoot it for as long as you want down Ethernet and then decode it on the other end. And it is basically the world's longest HDMI cable. It will work. You will get low latency. And you and yeah, the only thing that this doesn't have is NDI. But in this case, I, I'm, I hope I'm showing you that it's not necessary when in use with your um, with your ATEM. Also, these are 69 bucks a pair. And these will go for, I am, usually it's like 100 meters. They're, they're really going to go far. So I still think this is your best bet. Uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, and uh, if, if the bait and switch was not good enough from, from Jason uh, this time, um, if you need to be using NDI, you, of course, need something that is decoding NDI into the physical uh, realm of the ATEM. And one way to do it, we have um, some small uh, boxes from um, uh, Birdog, which is also mentioned in the chat, which is called uh, the Birdog Play, which is actually just a network appliance that converts into a HDMI uh, signal. Um, that is mostly working okay. We use it internally for uh, distributing NDI to different displays or, or um, TVs in our facility uh, and it has been proven proven to be uh, pretty pretty stable uh, there's also this um uh, this uh, Zoe box which is kind of in the cheap end uh, scale uh, and that also does uh, conversion to uh, from NDI uh, into um, into the physical uh, uh, HDMI or SDI plugs uh, that is something I am thinking of testing out. So the Zoe box is my kind of go-to thing because that box can also be used for other stuff as well as uh, encoding the other way around. So And it also supports RTMP and SRT, etc. So it's a more uh, complete box that can be used for something else in, in the future as well. So that's the two things I would um, uh, think of. Jason? 
Uh, Ronnie, how much does that cost? In my experience, um, NDI is kind of like Dante in that all the money comes from getting it in and getting it out. And then the neat part is once it's in there, it's really inexpensive. So what it, just, I, I'm curious, what is the cheapest decoder, hardware decoder that, that you are aware of that, that can do this? I think it has to be the Zoe box. And that's around $200, uh, if I'm not mistaken. In 169 maybe, 180. US. Yeah, 169 so that's the cheapest way of doing it. And you are perfectly right. Uh, the NDI conversions in and out physical is the where is where they actually gener generate a lot of. Uh, I think it's a, a pretty high license to pay for using that. So, um, for all practical means, I wouldn't use NDI if I was to um, uh, to be uh, saving money. I would use a cable, as you suggested. Just uh, that's the best suggestion so far. If you've already got a lot of concrete into the pipeline or into your workflow uh, and you're going to stick with NDI, I'll echo something that Daniel Partridge said in the chat, which was kind of alluding to your original idea, which was to use a laptop. So if you have uh, a laptop that can run OBS, you can turn that into an NDI receiver and then output to HDMI. You're going to have to fiddle with it a little bit uh, because you're going to have to deal with latency issues and things like that. But uh, the other thing is if you have an Apple TV lying around and that you can put uh, the Sienna receiver on, that would be another way to do that. And then, uh, but remember, when you're running a computer as a video source, you really have to treat it like an appliance and make sure that there is nothing else running on that computer. It is as bare bones as possible and that you're not going to, for whatever reason, overload it and start to see any sorts of frame drops. Ronnie? Yeah, suddenly, uh, I suddenly came to think of the, uh, the player app that actually there are different player apps on uh, that you can run on uh, either iPhones or so you can have an iPhone in the other end with the adapter and uh, going out to HDMI and you just use a play application or play app uh, on that uh, device as well. I wouldn't use that in production, but that's uh, if you have old phones uh, <laughs> laying around and you just need the 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 either Lightning or USB C to uh, to HDMI adapter. That is also one way to do it. All right, Gabrielle, you thank you again for bringing that back around and helping us get you to the answer. Uh, let us know how it goes. Next question. Jeff Velian Henderson is asking, what tips do you have for a speaker working with a live real-time translator for a virtual event on Zoom? Bill? Uh, my, my first thing would be take your time. I'm assuming that we say for a speaker working with that might be you. If it's not you and you're working with a professional speaker, uh, generally the rule is keep out of their way because they have a thing in their head. They're going to be presenting their presenta presentation the way they want to. If you're working with a professional real-time translator, they are used to that. They are used to working with people who have varying paces. Uh, if you have control over any part of that, as somebody who's done some speaking, if I know it's going to be in uh, translation, I will try to slow down at least a little bit because my typical, like, the pace that I ramble things off at here when I know people are mostly listening and can see me uh, often, I will talk pretty quickly. Uh, one of the toughest lessons in the audiobook world that I've had is slow down, slow down, slow down. Uh, you don't need to rush. And if you look at the really great professional speakers out there, they use space and let people have time to think about each thing they say. And they don't just run it all together. But in these conversational days, that's what we tend to do. And if you have not done a ton of – well, if anyone hasn't done a ton of professional speaking, one of the things that happens is the adrenaline hits when you go live up there. And the next thing you know, you just hey, – yeah, this is what I want to tell you. And I want to tell you three other things. And then this thing over here, and then I'm going to come back to this thing over here. And that would drive any translator obviously crazy. So if you have some control, be nice to your translator, please. If you don't, though, stay out of the way of the speaker. Let them do their thing. Let the professional translator do their thing. And don't try to over-direct them. Ronnie? Yeah, well, I think uh, Jeff uh, uh, is thinking of at least three different things. So we can choose to answer it with technicalities or equipment-wise, or we can um, speak about the software and how to use the software. Or, or third, as uh, as already mentioned, how the workflow would be and and how the the translator is um, is doing uh, their work. I will start with the last one. They need to know the subject that is being discussed very well um, so they need to be if it's medical they need to be 
well-versed in the medical realm to just be able to translate this uh, with a good and fluid uh, translation. So that's the first thing I would really expect the translator to be uh, doing. Um, as a, a professional uh, translator, they will probably be asking about this as well. Uh, for the second thing, uh, working with uh, with uh, technology uh, is really uh, difficult. And if they haven't been using Zoom's translation system before, they need to train. Um, they have to be used to how do they um, send this over to the next translator when they are having a pause. They need to be uh, knowing how the software is acting, what buttons to push, etc. So that's uh, that's uh, the thing that they need to be aware of. You as an organizer need, of course, to be uh, knowing all the functionality related to translations in the Zoom um, control panel where you set uh, set up this uh, webinar or meeting. That's that's the software part of it. And then the first part, which is uh, the technicalities and the equipment you use. When we have translators working for us, we make sure they have a really high quality microphone because we need the microphone they are using to be more like a podcast microphone, at least a Shure MV7 or similar, to uh, make sure they sound the best uh, out of their voice in the language that everybody else is listening to. Uh, there is also some problems when they are wearing headsets that they have a really high volume in their headsets. Most translators prefer to have really high volume to be able to overdrive their ears with the signal higher than the speaking voice. So they are kind of trying to eliminate listening to themselves when they are speaking. And that can sometimes um, cause uh, a bleed out from the headset going into the microphone. So make sure you have really, really... Um, um, what is it called? Please help me. Not open headsets, but isolation. Uh, yeah, so headsets which is really good uh, isolation in, so that you don't have a bleed out from the headset because they have high volume on that. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, making sure they have an environment in a room that actually sounds good as well. Not to talk about all these translation booths that we are being used to listen to, which is really just sounding like a box. So if they have a good room, uh, and they probably sit at home in their home office, make sure the room is uh, really good uh, uh, voice voicing as well. So it sounds good. Bill? Excuse me, just really quickly, James or Jeff, who asked the question, is in the chat. So he said, "Yes, I'm the speaker and producer." So uh, just you know, if you can get a chance to chat with your with your translator um, interpreter um, ahead of time, it'd be great. Uh, and try to keep it modest, but you shouldn't have any problems. Just um, a couple of questions or a couple of answers from James Fowley. He said, "Put a compressor on the feed to the interpreter." It is important that they understand everything, and it comes through clearly. And professional interpreters are very used to using Zoom, and I think most work from home these days, and I 100% agree with that. You shouldn't have any problems. Don't expect problems. Just be clear, and everything should go fine. Next question. From the QR code, Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada is asking, looking for a mid to low price 1080p HD 32-inch TV that pairs well with a Mac Mini M2 that I can leave always on for weeks with no burn-in screen. Jason? All right, Chester, I'm going to give you two out of three because there is no such thing as an LED that is completely immune to burn-in. That, that, that is not a thing. But um, I, when I show this to you, it's probably going to sell out pretty quickly. So if you go to Monoprice, they've got this great thing where if you look, it's um, what, the third or fourth down, limited deals from top brands. This is a Samsung 1080p, 32-inch uh, TV, QLED, and it's $170. And um, that should do you pretty well. Also, I would take a look at potentially a uh, at that size, looking at computer monitors in addition to a television. Sometimes you're able to get uh, a better quality screen out of a computer monitor when you don't have to have all of those TV bits baked in. Next question. Next question is from Ryan Thomason, Houston, Texas. Back to the Downey question. What are people using for Windows, Linux, Android, even Chrome extensions for video capture on YouTube? Go ahead, Paul. Paul, can you hear us? 
All right, no sweat. I think Paul might have been might have had a drop out there. Um, I'm not a Windows guy, and uh, I at least when it comes to the uh, <laughs> when it comes to downloading, like I'll use Windows as kind of a utility if I need it for a 3D printer or a laser cutter or something like that. But I, I admittedly am not the Windows person, and uh, I usually uh, will just bunt this to Courtney, but he's not here today, so I'm I'm flying without my net. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you can hear us now. If you wanted to hop back in as a, a downy alternative for Windows, if you can hear us now. Uh, yeah, the downy. I had a little bandwidth issue there. Uh, downy's great. I'm I'm looking at it. Looks like it's going to be really worthwhile. Do you and, find one uh, that has worked on Windows or Linux? Yeah, or the Chrome extension. The uh, Cobalt is fantastic on. Oh, Windows. that will work cross platform. Oh, good. Uh, since it's since it's browser based. It will probably work on Linux and the other platforms also. Sorry sorry about the bandwidth issue there. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, yeah, earlier the we were comparing Cobalt and Downey, but it uh, looks like Cobalt is, is in the browser. So Paul's given that the Paul Wallace, Wallhoose seal of approval. So check that out, Ryan. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, Adam Audio will be entering the desktop monitor market. Thoughts? Uh, go ahead, Alexander. This is really interesting. I've actually uh, not heard of this, and I sell Atom products. Uh, I really like their studio monitors. If they're anything like even their most... The, here's the thing about Atom Audio. So if you're looking at their entire product line for studio near-field monitors, the T-Series is their most more affordable uh, product line that compares with like the KRK Rockets and the Yamaha HS series. Uh, but by far, they are some of the best-sounding studio monitors at that price point. So if these are going to be at an even lower price point and sound anything near as good as even the T-Series, I'll be very impressed. The magic seems to be that ribbon tweeter, uh, because that ribbon tweeter is able to, uh, because of the ultra-low mass, it's able to uh, basically move faster and reproduce transients quicker. And I find that they image incredibly well and provide a lot of details. So I'll have to take a listen to him, but I'm very excited about this. Bill? Yeah, there's what they look like. Uh, the only thing that kind of stopped me for a moment, and I don't know what the technology of base drivers out of small bridge type monitors are, but a 3.5 inch woofer is pretty small for getting down there. So I wouldn't try to mis mix disco on it. Other than that, they're probably going to be nice and crisp and certainly you'll be able to get an articulate sound out of them. Alexander? I haven't looked at the spec sheet before, but now just getting a better look at the photo. It looks like they have a passive radiator. You can see if you go, I don't know if you can pull that up again, but on, on, that, on the side of the speaker cabinet, it looks like there's a passive radiator. So that's actually a very common design in ultra small uh, packages because obviously we're dealing with limitations of physics. Bill talked about, uh, you know, limitations with bass and small drivers. That's one way that you can kind of get around with that is having a passive radiator on the side, which will help with reproducing low end. And the other thing too, with a lot of modern uh, studio monitors is they have a lot of complicated internal uh, DSP, that's digital signal processing, that also helps with things like room correction in you know where where you're placing things they've got correction now for whether or not you have the speakers pushed up against the wall or if they're freestanding so there's a lot of really complicated stuff going on internally in the processing that can make those things sound better than they should be in a small package the ik multimedia iloud micro monitors if you ever get a chance to listen to those those sound incredible not only are they loud but they put out a surprising amount of low end for a tiny little three and a half inch driver. So uh, technology is getting better all the time with this stuff. Ronnie? Don't underestimate the power of uh, really small speakers. This is my beloved Neumanns. Uh, they are sounding incredible, but they are near field monitors. They also have these uh, uh, DSP built in. I have software where I can control the DSP with an app. Uh, there's a network port uh, in the back of the of the speaker, as you can see. Are those the KH80s? Yeah, that's the KH80s. Yeah, those are great. Is. They they sound amazing, and the speakers, you know, they are like my headphones, <laughs> almost. Sounds great. And Bill, this is weird, but I just pulled up. Uh, can you see that? Uh, that it looks like they're not individual speaker wired that you're sending the feed into the right speaker and then there's an XLR cable it looks like that goes from the right to the left 
and there's no separate thing. So there must be some sort of app to do balancing and and you know tune them up. That I've never seen that before. Uh, rather than the controls on both speakers, you got controls and everything and all the connections on one speaker, and it just single cable attaches to the next. That's an odd way to proceed with stereo pair, but maybe it works fine. I don't know. Next question. Robert Linkrum in Belmont Shore, California is asking, can the panel recommend a black and white laser printer that is not made by Samsung? Jason. Sure. Gladly. Uh, my girlfriend just went to law school, and this is the one that after a lot of research I ended up getting for her. It is the Brother HL L2460DW. It is wireless. It is also Ethernet, and the larger um, the larger toner will print 3,000 pages and then ask you for another, I don't know, um, not very much money in toner. So this, this, as far as I'm concerned, is a complete and total win. Ronnie, real quick. Yeah, since this is a Friday, I just suggest using a pen like this. This is given to me by Sonect. Sharpie 2000. Black and white. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, I've upgraded to Sequoia. Would you migrate from Bitwarden to Apple Passwords for password management and two-factor authentication? Jason? I wouldn't, and, and here's why. Unless I have a compelling security reason to push something like a password manager and to shift it, um, I find that Apple historically tends to heavily favor and, and test their own things with their own products. And so even if you're Mac only, unless you're on Safari all the time, and you know if you deviate in any way, shape, or form, you're going to get some gotchas there. And if you're already comfortable with Bitwarden, I, I see no great advantage to this. Bill? Well, I think Jason has to work in both environments. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm feeling increasingly comfortable with keeping all my passwords in the Apple system because they've made it so seamless. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best, but I do not want to spend any more time on the tech part of my career than I need to. I understand I need to, and sometimes I can be proven wrong about these things, but so far, uh, Sequoia has been pretty flawless, and I didn't have... Uh, robust old password management, and I like the fact that I'm getting a lot of two-factor authentication requests. That it's thing, you know, this is exposed. It, at least let us make sure. I'm just seeing more and more security pumped in automatically into the Mac system, and I like that. That's me, Alexander. Yeah, if you're already using Bitwarden, it's such an incredibly secure and robust application. If you, especially if you're technically minded. Uh, but f for me, uh, when coming from one password, because I didn't want to pay a, a subscription anymore, uh, I moved to iCloud Keychain. And then when Apple introduced iCloud Family Password Sharing, and especially now with a standalone password app, it just, I, for me, I, I like the simplicity and I wouldn't move away. And it does two-factor auth. It does all that stuff with the QR code. So for me, it does everything that I needed to be. But if, I've, if I was an IT professional full-time, uh, you know, the Bitwarden application, especially if I needed something that, that to be cross-platform compatible, I would absolutely use it. Yeah, the one thing for me with Apple Passwords that's missing is the ability to store things that aren't passwords. When I adopted 1Password as my uh, password manager of choice, I found all of a sudden, hey, my DaVinci Resolve license key and uh, this secret combination to something that's not a website password or a passport number or things that I don't want to leave just in plain Jane notes, but I'd like to be able to sync to devices that aren't necessarily within the Apple ecosystem. I found that really, really useful. Um, I tried, I did the export out of one system. I brought it into the other just to kind of road test the passwords app. And that was the one thing that was missing for me. The nice thing is for all of the folks who don't have a password management solution, they now have a very powerful uh, password manager that comes with it. So like there is something that is uh, the tyranny of the default, right? Oh, a lot of people are going to use this because it's the default. This is better than nothing at all. If, if this wasn't there for the folks that weren't using a password manager before, they would never use a password manager. Now they're going to be introduced to the concept and hopefully lead a, a more safe online existence. Don't reuse your passwords. You got to change it. A um, couple quick announcements before we wrap the top of the hour. Uh, we have tomorrow is our Saturday Q&A, which is uh, just one hour Q&A in the morning and then at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific noon Eastern. We've got the panelist meeting. So if you're 
if you were at the new panelist meeting last Saturday and now you want to be at the regular panelist meeting where we kind of have a Sunday style show where we say about what's going on with the panelists, how to be on the panel, what are we looking for, uh, you can do that there. Sunday, we have our introspection show, and that's uh, live only as is Saturday live only. So you have to be in Makana to uh, get the links on how to get there. And you can go to officehours.global slash join if you want the links to get into Makana. And finally, if you like what you're seeing, you could consider supporting us. If you go to officehours.global slash donate, that's officehours.global slash donate. We sure would appreciate it. All right, today on Office 